think I have a lot hotter. Yeah, it is yeah. really warm in here. Yeah. It's not just me. No. <laughs> <laughs> You're also, you can pick up like white coat. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm clearly, and then it's just glued to my between pain and pleasure. So from a discussion based at a medical school, where where does this get us? Something is wrong. Um, I'm not so sure he'd say it was clinically significant though. Say it as a massacre. Yeah. 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 So I, 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 think, I think I think the the flow had improved one of the reasons why I paired this with the skin I live in, is that where the skin I live in allows for um, a leap to discuss gender dysphoria, Hellraiser allows for a review of the paraphilias, including, uh, in this case, um, sadistic disorder. So pain and pleasure one. Is there anything further, though, with regard to topics in psychiatry or psychology that this also, I think, addresses. How are these beings conjured? Through the bus. Right, through the Lamarckian configuration, right? So solving the puzzle box, okay? And they come from a, another region, I think that's there. Uh, and anything else that they have told us that might lead us. Well, let's say you solved a puzzle box. I don't know why you'd be playing with that thing. <laughs> Certainly in the 80s, it was one of my most feared objects, my most phobic objects. Uh, but, you know, you guys are different than I am. And you guys played with this Lamarckian configuration. And you, and, um, you have a similar experience. Present to me. What, what am I working on my differential diagnosis here? <clears throat> Let's rule out substance use, <laughs> right? And other yeah. disorders. And yeah. Psychotic. Yeah. So sure. Uh, it sounds psychotic, or at least in the psychotic dissociative spectrum. Yeah. And one of the first things we have to consider is whether or not, whether we call it psychosis, whether we call it dissociation, that it's substance induced. And which substance, or class of substance, <laughs> might we begin with? Yeah, hallucinogens. Now there's three subtypes or subclasses of hallucinogens. What are they? The nitrous, nitrous. Uh, that's that's in Helens. Oh. Uh, I like where your mind is going. LSD. Uh, LSD, which are the psychedelics. Right? LSD is a, an example of a psychedelic. Two other subclasses. Dissociatives. Dissociatives. Uh, what, what's an example of a dissociative? Ketamine. Ketamine, right? PCP would be another. And then the third subclass of MDMA. MDMA. Um, probably a psychedelic, okay. although it's it's classified as a stimulant. Yeah. But there there are crossover properties. The other subclass is a delirium, mm -hmm. right? Uh, Anti-coercion medications, delirium, right? So deliriates, dissociatives, and psychedelics. Which subclass do we think we're working in here? Psychedelic or maybe dissociative. I mean, it's probably one or the other. I don't, I don't know if we're seeing true delirium here. Okay, okay so certainly a, you're, in, you're in drug screen to begin with. <laughs> um, any signs or symptoms of any of the characters perhaps further supporting this being hallucinogen induced, and if so, 
what particular subclass of hallucinogen the psychedelics versus the dissociatives? Me too. I don't, I mean, there's nothing in the script. <laughs> uh, we'll take some creative, creative liberty so we can get to other teaching points. But for there, uh, at this point, um, I think that might be the role of the set box. Now, have you ever seen these beings before? I don't mean in real life. Why, if somebody pulls their arms, she's keeping something from them. <laughs> but uh, not in real life. I mean, um, have you ever had or experienced a retread? of the Cenobites. Like angels to some, demons to others? I mean, I kind of, I, I think the idea of like being above earthly emotion is almost a religious thing. The idea and that you have beings that don't experience things the same way we do. And you're right. And I, I think, if not in the movie, definitely in the book on which the movie is based, um, Pinhead introduces himself then as theologians. Right. So yeah, there's there's certainly been all that. There's that. Um, I don't know if you experienced this when watching it the first time, uh, but uh, there is a significant spiritual aspect of Hellraiser. Also, when they first walked into the house, there was like Jesuses everywhere. You know what I mean? Yeah. And correct me if I'm wrong. It's, what do I know? But for like, please, no, for like the, um, what's, you said, angels to some, demons to others, wasn't, I believe that biblical angels, it was like for good people, like they draw you in, it's, you know, not scary and stuff, but for like actual demons and bad stuff, it's terrifying, and they, they leave, you know what I mean? I thought, I thought of another two volumes for saying that I was, um, it's like tying into Greek mythology, I, I feel like there, I mean, all of the gods, almost all of them, would like, I don't know, like, do something wrong to humans or punish them, but would also um, reward them. So maybe you could interpret it like that, too. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I, I agree with you, but I fall short of saying that they're the equivalent to the Olympic gods. Any comment off of that? Observation. What do they do? What's their role? <coughs> Other than somehow merged sex with pain. Oh well, the Olympic gods loved. They they con they were constantly finding people and like having children, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, I felt like they also they would punish people for doing. Anything like if you look at them wrong, that's it. You're dead. Mm -hmm. So they either reproduce or they kill people because they can, because they're gods. Very Freudian, right? The death instinct and the libido, right? the sex instinct. <coughs> Cenobites. What do they do? What's the role? I mean, they almost seem to like arbitrate, and that they can decide who they're going to be taking, and, and not really seem as though they're creators of judgment, but not necessarily particularly involved in the person. Yeah. They're, they're coming as judgment day. Uh, and, and they are portrayed two things. What two things are they? There are two people, or two types of people that certainly, upon meeting the Cenobites, would have an unfortunate fate. Number one, those individuals who go against the cultural norm and perhaps even engage in cultural taboo. These are the keepers of society. And number two, even if you haven't violated the cultural norm but have conjured them incorrectly, Kirsten? Kirsten? Yeah. Kirsten? 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 Um, that unfortunately would get you on their list too. Greek mythology. Who are we talking about here? Wait, what, it's the fact that what that, that she opened the box basically. Uh, well, both. Is that what you're if, you're, if you're conjured erroneously, or if you're conjured and have violated Greek norms. Hades, right? 
I thought it was just the big three in general. Nope. No? No, no matter of fact, the gods themselves even had to answer to them. Is it the fates? Yeah. Okay. That's right. So the fates. And it's interesting because once you understand the Cenobites are the fates, just recreated in the 1980s, they take on a completely different role. Completely different role. They're after Frank because he violated the terms of the agreement. He had violated a cultural norm. And they're after Kirsty because she erroneously conjured them. And that's exactly what the fates did as well. So we could look at this particular film as a case study of sadism and masochism, sadistic disorder, masochistic disorder, and we'd be right. There's no way that isn't correct. However, if we changed our perspective on who the Cenobites are, uh, we could also look at this from a completely different view. Because who does conjure them and conjures them correctly? In the beginning of this movie. Yeah, Frank. Yeah, Frank Cotton, yeah. right? And this is a case study, as far as they're concerned, of someone who will experience the most nether regions of pain and pleasure. And Frank uh, certainly uh, is then painted as a, a fairly deplorable character. Mm -hmm. right? But he searched for this. Yeah. So provide me some insight as to what type of person would find this box in Tibet. He wouldn't look for a box like this. Didn't he say he had like passed all of the other feelings and he was searching for some, some new sensation, which is exactly. also <laughs> sensation. It seems yeah. a bit superlative. So, yeah, so give me the neurobiology behind Frank's report that the material earth can no longer provide him a re any reinforcing experience. I feel like it needs to be someone who really abused substances, right? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Desensitization. Desensitive. Yeah. Give me the neurobiology behind it. You mean like reward Yeah. Like natural tests? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
So there's some consistency with regard to episodes of sleep paralysis and visual hallucinations because of the dyssynchrony of REM sleep around 3 or 3.30, consistent with that surge in DMT resulting in a Hellraiser type experience. Right, so this is often referred to as the shadow people, uh, which are thought to be aliens, which of course the Cenobites probably are. Different realm. Right? DMT experience, hallucinogen. Is Frank Cotton using DMT? I mean, would it really be out of the ordinary? Is the Lamarcher configuration just met for? And is that, that is DMT, what he is really using to open up his subconscious, to have that psycho-spiritual experience? So the psycho-spiritual crisis is a newer term in psychiatry. And it has resulted in the experimentation through clinical trials of medications in the hallucinogen class, LSD, psilocybin, DMT. And there's also techniques that enable the individual to increase their own endogenous DMT, DMT uh, outside of the 3.30 hour, uh, sometimes the hyperventilate, uh, during a psychotherapy session titled breath work. You can serve your own DMT at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, and hopefully under the guidance of a therapist, a trained therapist. And by inducing that, and inducing that experience, you work through a psycho-spiritual crisis. And it's called breath work. Goff, or maybe one, maybe with the R, yeah. Groff and Sassman. I've heard about this, yeah, yeah. Very interesting papers to read from those authors. Right now considered to be fringe psychiatry, but with emerging evidence-based data, uh, it's not going to be fringe for long. Dr. Zodiac, my dad just did that. He went and, um, with, to his friends to this like training program in Florida, and it was like a week of like intense breath work with like, therapeutic experience. So they do that now, and they do it, I believe, like three more times over the next two years. And then they'll be like certified to teach it themselves because that's what they're interested in. But he said it was really intense. It's pretty intense. Yeah. yeah. And it's done, breath work that is, it's done without the aid of supplemental ayahuasca or DMT. It's naturally occurring, it's self induced. Right. Right. Uh, but it, it's for psychotherapy now. Right. And this, uh, that is the evidence based nature of it, is the use of hallucinogens in general, LSD, psilocybin. Um, that used to be or gained efficacy with microdosing, but now being macrodose to enter into a psycho spiritual crisis resolved under the care of a psychiatrist or other trained therapist to process and to work through depression, anxiety, and other, other uh, mental disorders. So, depending on which perspective you'd like to come from, the Cenobites might be demons. They might be evil. They might be the antagonists in a slasher, 1980s slasher film. And Frank Cotton may in fact be the most deplorable character ever created, given how things that would be taboo to you and I simply no longer give him gratification because of a blunted reinforcement. On the other hand, the Cenobites uh, might be angels. And they might be the keepers of the societal norm, modern day fates. Excuse me, furies. No, um, fates. No, I'm sorry, right. furies. I'm going back. It's the furies. And maybe Frank Cotton is having a psycho spiritual crisis that he's working through. And to the extent that he is in the position that he is in this film, maybe he is shamanistic. So not a deplorable character, but someone who actually people would seek out for help. All depending on perspective. One perspective allows us to review the sexual disorders, the other, the use of hallucinogens in treating mental disorders, which again is an emerging research. What are the characters like to discuss here? You think of Julia? Yeah. <laughs> she was there. Oh, I just really like the bowl. Excuse me? 
is not very likable. <laughs> and they deserved each other. <laughs> Frank and <Jesus. laughs> So at what point in the movie did you lose empathy for Julia? I've always rooted for her. Yeah, you know, I don't get it, Alex. <laughs> Alex, you have no, no, a differing opinion. <laughs> like, oh no, I'm actually curious why. Like, what do you think was redeemable about her? Redeem? I mean, I don't know. She was just the most interesting character in the entire movie. Like, oh. in my opinion, I don't know. She obviously, I guess, disclaimer: the thing that she did wasn't good. You know, she led people to their deaths. But I don't know. Everyone was. Everybody said, "Oh, Julia is so uptight. Oh, Julia is such a you know." bad word, blah, 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 blah. But she was just doing what she needed to do. She had, she got into this boring marriage, you know, her ex-boyfriend died, and he was a lot more exciting, and here she is, miserable. So that's my take on that, sorry. I, you know, I understand where you're coming from, but I feel like when you take into account, like, there is, like, a child, and she's just, like, being, like, she, like, literally doesn't care about the kid and puts her own needs. It's not over. her kid. She's weird. Yeah, but still. She's weird, what? She has weird body language, I was going to say. Like, even before any she's of that stuff, she would... I don't know if it's, it could just be the actress, honestly. But, like, she... There was, there was the time where, like... It, like, just the first time Kirstie walks in... Kirstie? Oh, my God. It's Kirstie. Kirstie. Anyway, Kirstie. Kirstie. When she walks in, like, I think she's, like, at the staircase. She's just standing there like this, like, straight face. And she's like, hello? Like, she's, like, Julia? And she's just, like, standing there like this. So, <laughs> why why not... And when we talk about this with regard to um, Vincente, uh, Vera... Uh, but why not dissociation, uh, having had clearly a traumatic relationship with Frank? That's true. Because and he seduces that, it, her and rapes her on her wedding day. Mm-hmm. Oh, is that like how? Yeah, you know, when she goes into the room and sees her wedding dress, splashes back. Yeah, but no, she, but I seem pretty consensual. Yeah, I think the way I, I watched it. Do you think Frank would allow anybody to consent? Do you think it matter? Mm-hmm. Did she know? Did she well, think understand that like, matter? Remember. Those things that we had difficulty talking about, this guy has done and no longer brings him any satisfaction. I guess it just, I guess the reason why I say that is because he, she seemed very attracted to him. Yeah. But I guess you're, you're but like, are, but like, would that be like a, just because of that, like maybe like a, not, I guess, Markhouses or whatever, because he doesn't really like capture her, but like something similar. Well, are you mean, mean like softball? Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say softball yeah. because like, yeah. Maybe initially she's afraid, and then she goes through all this trouble to like basically murder people to like keep him alive. Essentially, it seems like it's an abusive relationship. So I definitely had some yeah. people. Or maybe like dependent personality traits. But like, yeah, that's what I was too. But I, I guess yeah, I, I, I guess I, I, I thought I kind of interpreted that scene in particular as more of like, like he definitely was the one who like seduced her but i i guess i saw it as more consensual and then it it sort of spiraled into more of an abusive relationship but i'm just curious why like yeah so no, i think i think the the bedroom scene uh, was strongly suggestive of a while not necessarily physically trying to stop his advances point b is that my belief is that she recognized it was done no good uh, I think Frank's reputation has preceded him. Remember, she met him, the way she meets him when he's at that door, mm-hmm. she's already heard about him. Mm-hmm. So this is a guy who's done time, this is a guy who's uh, likely molested children before. Again, the, all those things yeah, like that he's done so repetitively that they no longer gain him any gratification. That's how depraved her brother-in-law is. And I think once you recognize that, uh, I'm not so sure she was it was going to be able to say no thank you. Yeah. And I think she realizes that. Again, that's speculation. Uh, but um, that's where I think Julia's role is here. Now, what would have been interesting, uh, and Clive Barker didn't ask me, so that's not in my opinion, is if uh, her husband whose name is I know, I was, but I, I think it's actually it's because he's so boring. No, I think that's actually a really good thing. And I, I wonder if they did that intentionally because even now I, I don't remember the name. I completely agree with you. If he had an extramarital affair, it would have been, I think, informative with regard to the plot of Hellraiser. Yeah. And that's because Clyde uh, of would have been the original that this particular, and I think it is anyway, I think Clyde of in the Aura style is actually the plot to Hellraiser. And I think 
Phytonextra is a, um, or I should say Julia, is nothing more than a re-representation of Agamemnon's wife. All right, so when Agamemnon returns from the Trojan War with his concubine, Cassandra, um, Clytonextra plots to kill him, which is the exact same thing that happens here. Matter of fact, Clytonextra, um, literally classic cutter, does so with a knife. And although Julia uses a hammer in the movie, she uses a knife. I mean, she's true to Clytonextra in the book. Oh, yeah, he has the knife, too. Frank has the... So again, we have a Greek tragedy shaping up here. Well, and well, and it's really now. I, I feel like now I see why we kind of went with uh, killing of sacred deer the other week because it's like this. It's the, almost the same story. I mean, it's same, similar characters because it's whose daughter is like Iphigenia is technically part of this, but it's like the, yeah. the daughter of one of the yeah. characters in this story. Yeah, she, she's she's the other other book. Yeah. I mean, not, not part of the trilogy, but she's another book that's related. But, I mean, this is the House of Atreus. This, this is Agamemnon. Agamemnon's daughter was last week, and yeah. this week is his son. So this is the Norris Tide. Uh, by the way, who is Chris? Who is Kirsty? Other than being the trope of the final girl in an 80 slasher movie, which, again, it's awesome. Um, what, what are some other aspects about this particular character, which again is, is itself a trouble. I was wondering if she was like molested by Frank just because of definitely, the interaction. Definitely was. was. Yeah. But that wouldn't sleep real fast, yes. Okay. <laughs> the other aspect of Kirsty is that she knows what's going on and tries to tell people, and they of course don't believe her, mm -hmm. which is classic 80s horror. But it's also classic Greek myth. Right? That, that's Cassandra, right? the gift of prophecy. But having nobody believe you. Oh, right, that's so, right. Yeah. Uh, and Kirsty, aka Cassandra, is another key figure in the Orisaia. What else about these characters? Again, a husband whose name I don't remember. <laughs> Julia and Kirsty. I'm starting to feel bad for Julia now. <laughs> yeah, I changed my mind. <laughs> Julia mentioned some dependent traits. We had uh, reviewed briefly the cluster B personality disorders in the last hour. Um, let's use that as a prompt to review the cluster C personality disorders now. The first uh, is dependent personality disorder. Individuals who have dependent personality need every next step reassured and validated. So they go through excessive lengths to gain reassurance. That is the cardinal trait. Look at the DSM criteria. They are nothing more than examples of that cardinal trait. Individuals who constantly require your attention and affirmation are going to have a very specific countertransference. Right? So you're, you're going to feel weighted with regard to how much reassurance you must get. It's a very typical and characteristic countertransference for someone with dependent personality disorder. Uh, along with, and I'll pull from the cluster B personalities previously reviewed, along with antisocial and borderline, the dependent personality does tend to improve with age. They're, so that's three of four personality disorders that tend to improve with advancing age. On the other hand, the avoidant personality, yet another personality disorder that tends to improve with age, and that's four of four, is defined through avoidance behavior. So it's fairly straightforward and easy. Their personality is to avoid social contact because of feelings of inadequacy. Right? So again, cardinal trait. Unlike the person with schizoid personality disorder, the individual with avoided wants very dearly to have social contact, but because of feelings of inadequacy, does not see it. All right? So they live by the credo of it is better to have never loved at all than to have loved and lost. Like, if I don't put myself out there, I won't get hurt. And their avoidance behavior is actually reinforced because at the end of the day, they don't have any type of shame or guilt. Right? There's nothing negative that happened because they didn't go out that night. So their avoidance behavior is actually reinforced. Avoidance behavior then is perpetuated and strengthened. What type of reinforcement 
owes to the perpetuation of the avoidance personality. It's negative reinforcement. There's no stimulus. Right. Lack of. Right. So the embarrassment never happens. Negative. The avoidance behavior persists. Reinforcement, negative reinforcement, is the teaching mechanism, the teaching model, paradigm, that results in the perpetuation of symptoms defining avoidant personality disorder. However, it is one that tends to improve with age because with regard to whether it be school, a job, making money, having a lifestyle, people must put themselves out there. And when they don't actually get the adverse or negative feedback, they begin to learn over time that it isn't as dangerous as my mind had made it out to be. So these are your late bloomers. Uh, they, uh, that is, uh, the deep, uh, excuse me, avoidant personality disorder does tend to improve with age, alone with dependent. And then the other two, cluster B, which would be borderline and antisocial. The final cluster C is the obsessive compulsive personality, the perfectionist, the individual who needs total order and control. Right, so this is your type A personality. Um, more prevalent in males than females. It's one of the mental disorders in which there's a higher male prevalence. It's always good to know those. Uh, they do tend to bump on exams. Questions that cluster to see personality disorders? Any observations and further observations with regard to Hellraiser in general? Can I just ask, sorry, to ask a question. Does this have obsessive compulsive get worse with time because they're kind of reinforcing that there are positive outcomes with acting so controlling? So um, personality disorders are usually stagnant with relapses and, rem with, uh, relapses and remission. Uh, so they're, they're chronic conditions and OCPD is no different. Uh, so um, yeah, it's, uh, most people will tell you that it's stable over time. But if you see some worsening, especially with induced stress, uh, that would not uh, surprise anyone. And can someone with OCPD, like, develop OCD? Like, are those at all connected? They are connected because there's thought to be a common ideology. That is, um, isolation of affect, the defense mechanism, is thought to cause both obsessive compulsive disorder, the anxiety disorder, and OCPD, the personality disorder. Who here knows what isolation of affect is? Right. Anybody hear that? So when you're recalling or discussing a topic or idea, you're not emotionally invested in it. You're actually taking the affect or emotion, separating it from the idea, and isolating it in your subconscious. That allows you to discuss an idea without being emotionally attached to the discussion. Right? Very common practice for some people. <laughs> after your favorite sports team loses, and you've got to go to work the next Monday, the following day, after a horrible NFL Sunday. Right? Uh, sometimes you could easily tell people, don't talk to me. But when that someone happens to be your direct supervisor, you can't do that. Isolation of affect. You talk about the game, you talk about the stats, but you're not emotionally invested in the conversation. That's isolation of affect. Right. Very, very constructive, by the way. <laughs> However, it's only constructive until it's not. And if the individual becomes anxious due to that affect being isolated, they have to then resort to a secondary defense to resolve that anxiety when the, when the anxiety overwhelms the primary defense of isolation of affect. If that second defense is undoing, they're likely to present with obsessive compulsive disorder. They're likely to present with, with compulsions. Oh, yeah, exactly right. Undoing would be the compulsions. On the other hand, if this inner chaos was met with reaction formation, it's going to be outwardly manifest, confessed, by total order and control. Right? Reaction information, total opposite, order control, OCPD. Right? So the secondary defense defines the, um, the phenotypic expression. But the common variable, which is why OCP and OCPD are similarly named, is that isolation of that. Is there a reason why OCPD is more prevalent in males than females? No, 
my easy answer would have been, but as I'm saying, trying to hear it now in my head, I don't think it's true. I wonder if reaction information tends to be um, a defense mechanism that is more employable in males. I don't have any fact about that. It was, that that's just an idea. No, I have no idea. Yeah, no, I just find it interesting because I feel like most type A people I know are females. So it's, it's weird to like, think about. Um, make sure you, um, um, in looking back your data, correct for students and physicians. Right? Because there, the, the, the position, the vocation itself is a, is a confounder. So correct for that. Uh, but the, the text says males. I don't know. Maybe it'll change. Just in case you see it in the shelf. Other questions, thoughts, thoughts? You guys are good? All right, so we'll end it there.